everyone. We are really excited to have you here today at what is a uniquely Walmart event. We take on a challenge like sustainability, we set a really high target, and we get together on a regular basis to say, how are we doing against that target? And so we're proud to have you for the first time here in our Silicon Valley headquarters in San Bruno. So I want to welcome Mayor Ruane from the Mayor of San Bruno. Thank you for coming to join us this morning. San Bruno composted 765 tons of organic material, and I'm proud to tell you that almost 100 of those tons, or 13%, came from this building right here. So thank you for your leadership. So we are hosting this here in San Bruno because we decided as an organization that we wanted to combine the best of Walmart and the best of Silicon Valley in our e-commerce organization here. And we chose to build it here because there's such a great synthesis between the ethos of Walmart and the ethos of Silicon Valley. We wanted to build a technology company inside the world's largest retailer because we felt like we could do things that other people couldn't do. And so we brought together a really talented group of people, and those people have come here because they believe in our purpose. They believe in the opportunity to help people save money so that they can live better. They came for really hard challenges because we've got them, whether they're sustainability or strategic or technical or operational. They came because they really want to take on the hard stuff. They came because we can solve those problems differently than other folks because we have scale that, that other people don't. And finally, they came together for events like this because they're proud to be working with people that they respect professionally and personally. And so we're working hard to build best-in-class e-commerce and build an internet technology company inside the world's largest retailer. And so as we're here today, we're really excited because we have the opportunity to now take all of those skills, e-commerce, technology, and the power of Walmart, and apply it also to sustainability. So you'll hear some announcements later in the day of how we've pulled all that together, but I just wanted to begin the, the day by saying thank you for coming here and, part of, and being part of our, our milestone meeting and our evaluation of how we're making progress. So Doug, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, really great to be here in San Bruno, we'll be here in California for our milestone meeting today. Um, I think this is my third trip out to California so far this year. I'm a little bit concerned they're going to start taxing me. <laughs> when, um, when Kathleen said, let's have a milestone meeting in California, I thought, sure, that's easy. I'll be out there anyway, because we're, we're always out here. We've got several executive council members here today. Would you guys stand up for a second? Rollin and Roz and Greg are here. Please welcome Dan's here. Please welcome them this morning. Are you getting enough attention, Neil? Feeling good about that? <laughs> um, they asked me to come up for a little bit of time this morning and talk to you about this sustainability journey that we've been on. And it's really my, my pleasure and honor to do that, and, and I'll try to do it briefly, but there's a lot to tell. Um, I was excited when I walked in this morning to see Andy Rubin, and I want to ask Andy to stand up for a second and be recognized. For those of you that don't know, um, Andy was the very first leader. They started clapping before they even knew why they were clapping. <laughs> um, when we started our journey, Andy was the first leader that we put in charge of sustainability. And Lee was our CEO at the time, and he said, we're going to get started, and we're going to um, have a mighty team of one. And his name's Andy. 
And it was by design because what, what we didn't want to do is create bureaucracy and create a sustainability team that would take over the responsibility for changing the company. We actually wanted to change the company from within. So Andy couldn't get his job done unless he engaged all of us in a creative way, which he did, and really got us off to a great start. But if I go all the way back to the very beginning of the company, when we first opened a Walmart store in 1962, um, we were engaged in the community, but in a kind of a different way. I mean, our, our focus from our founder, Sam Walton, was to serve primarily two stakeholders, customers and associates. And he would literally say out loud, if we take care of those two, all the other stakeholders will benefit. So don't worry too much about what's printed in the newspapers in New York, just take care of those two stakeholders. Well, we grew the company from 62 onward in a big time way, really with that focus. We had a charitable giving program. We invested in the communities where we served and our store managers would hand out checks to all kinds of organizations within the towns where we existed. That was kind of the extent of it. And then at some point, we became big and expectations had changed. I think society in general had changed, but also the expectations of Walmart had changed. And a few uh, weeks ago, I had a lot of fun um, having a conversation with the former CEOs of the company and our chairman, Rob Walton. I wanted to show you this picture. This is from a few weeks ago, and you've got Rob in the center. Rob is the chairman of the company, obviously, and Sam Walton's son. David Glass, Lee Scott, Mike Duke, and I. And we sat down for a couple of hours on camera and just talked about the company, talked about our past, talked about how the company had changed. And at one moment in time, I looked over at Lee and, and asked him this question that I'm starting to talk to you about now, which is we entered into a different phase. We moved from that phase where we were just serving customers and associates to a phase where we started thinking about more stakeholders. And I asked him how that started and what it was about. And I'd like to play a little bit of the video there of, of his answer. People wanted to tell us, we just needed to tell our story better. We just need to tell the story better. You need to hire a better person in corporate affairs and tell the story better. But ultimately, what I arrived at, we needed a better story. That the world had changed around us and we hadn't changed. And that besides wanting great value and people who are treated well, the world had a different expectation. They believed that companies had a social responsibility that transcended just the regular business. And with Katrina, when our people stepped up, and we don't have time on any tape to talk about all the things that Walmart Associates did during Katrina, because it was just extraordinary. And so we ended up asking the question that how can we be that Walmart, the Walmart we were during Katrina? How can we be that Walmart all the time? Everything negative about being big comes to you without any effort. But how can you take what size and scope give you and the power they give you to do something that's really good? And we took a leadership role and we did it in a way that was good for the business. It was good for the associates. It was good for the suppliers. It was good for the customer. We didn't do something that was artificial that you couldn't maintain just by giving money away. We changed business practices in a way that were healthy, and, uh, and healthy not just for the environment, but healthy for the business. So um, Lee mentioned Katrina. About the same time that we were entering this second phase and starting to think about a broader set of stakeholders differently, the crisis happened in New Orleans related to the hurricane. And what we see here is a photograph of Walmart trucks that are trying to get into the impacted area to help people with supplies. And you can see this, this long row of trucks have, has been stopped by FEMA. To me, that's a bit symbolic. You know? <laughs> no, don't come and help. We got this. But it was obvious as those days went on around Labor Day that it wasn't going very well. And I remember being on conference calls, um, one of which was on a weekend where, where we were trying to meet the demands of Katrina. And Lee said, what if we went about this very differently? And just don't even think about what it costs. Let's go big. Whatever they need, water, whatever, Jason, whatever form of supplies they need, make it happen. And we'll count it later. 
and that's the approach that we took and it's it, to me very symbolic to see this image the other day um, Greg was having a town hall meeting in the US and there were associates who'd been brought in from the stores that were going to attend the town hall meeting and they came through my office Sam Walton's office because they wanted to see it before they went over to the town hall so all these people are coming through and there's this big truck driver Fernando that comes through his name is Gary Mars and one of the associates that's next to him says hey and what's that picture from? And they point at that image, which is behind my desk. There's a painting of this right behind my desk these days. And Gary said, yeah, I'm the sixth guy back. <laughs> I said, seriously, you're one of those truck drivers? Dude, come here, let me have my picture made with you, because you're like a hero. So now I want us to find all those truck drivers and see if we can get them to a Saturday morning meeting sometime. I think that'd just be too cool. Maybe we can go find them. So this moment in time happens where the company really stepped up and the pride that we had in the company at that moment was special. And Lee connected the dots to how do we go serve more stakeholders? How do we change the company, develop a better story, and tell the story more effectively by actually changing the company and being that company every day? So that kicked off the beginning of phase two, if you want to call it that. And today, what I can see is that we're moving beyond phase two, where we set some big goals like Let's be supplied 100% by renewable energy. Let's eliminate all waste in our system, and let's create a more sustainable supply chain. We're moving from that into a, a, an era where we're going to try and reshape systems, entire systems. And for those of you that are sustainable thinkers, you probably understand what I mean when I say that. But the idea is that everything from the raw material how the people are treated that make the product, how the people are treated that find the initial raw material that goes into product, and how the people are treated all the way through the supply chain that are involved in it, and all the things that are in those products can be managed in a way for a better system outcome. In our supply chains, there are situations where we're suboptimal. There's a flaw in the system somewhere, or more than one flaw in the system. And the idea that we have is to use the size and scale of the company, particularly related to the supply chain, to create more efficient, more sustainable, more effective systems. So if you think about food, for example, we can have an influence over how much water is used in product. We can eliminate or reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are involved in product. We can help optimize, reduce the levels of fertilizer that are used to create food. We can help eliminate waste in places like India and in developed markets like the United States by being more efficient at the way we handle food and the way we engage suppliers. So we have this unique opportunity to convene people. We can pull together stakeholders like um, farmers associations and co-ops. We can pull together NGOs. We can pull together members of government to help us create systems that are more sustainable. So as you think about our products and what we sell online, in stores, in clubs, and everywhere, we just want to have buyers and product development people and logisticians thinking in a sustainable way and looking for ways to reshape products and the supply chain behind those products to make them more sustainable. Today we've got an example from Hinkle. And this is a, a Purex laundry item. This is today's version. And this is tomorrow's version. It's called Purex Power Shot. And what this does is eliminate overdosing and it's more concentrated, so there's less water in it. This one's lighter than this one is. And it is 30% more efficient and 50% more effective from, from an um, efficacy point of view as it, as it cleans product. And moving from this to this doesn't cost the customer anything. It's designed in such a way that where there's no tax on them as it relates to buying a product that's more sustainable. Our team, along with Hinkle, helped create this situation, and we can do it hundreds of thousands of times over again. And that's the simple idea. The customer won't have to do anything different. They'll end up with a more sustainable product. We'll end up with a planet that's better for our kids and grandkids. Pretty simple. But we all have to lean in and make it happen. So we're counting on your help, and that's why we have meetings like the one that we're having today. Thank you all. I want to turn it over to Manuel Gomez. Please welcome him. Thank you, Doug. That was very inspiring. It's, it's great to be here in California in our first ever sustainability milestone meeting here in San Bruno. And I remember back in late 2005, I was working on strategy for Walmart Mexico in an auditorium, not as cool as this one for sure, listening to Lee Scott's speech 
and maybe feel so proud about working for Walmart, and today I feel even prouder. It made me feel that Walmart can really make a difference, a positive impact in the world, and we can drive change as few others can, and it made me fully understand the role of business in society. And I said one day I want to work on sustainability, and the great thing about this company is that it opens opportunities for us to grow and to follow our dreams. As Doug mentioned, we are uniquely positioned to reshape systems. And it's a great challenge, and it's exciting to do that. And we have four pillars that make us uniquely positioned for this. The first one is our associates, our culture that empowers associates to not only work on sustainability, but to make it part of their day-to-day -day job. It's not an extra, it's how you do your job, as Doug mentioned. We have more than two million associates, 27 countries, and we can make a difference. We, can, we have sustainability value networks, which is a group that gets together to tackle an issue and to make decisions, and they're empowered to do that. So it's live, it's not controlled centrally. That's exciting, it makes this happen, and makes, this, makes us want to lead on this. The next one is our capacity to bring sustainability accessible for all. Few can make sustainability affordable and accessible to the regular mom and dad that comes to our stores. Make it easy for them to understand and make products that have a low price and low prices don't have to come at a high cost to nature or to society. That's everyday low true cost, as Doug mentioned. And that's exciting and we can feel that we can make a difference. The third one is our scope and our scale. We're continuously testing new technologies from better lighting, to refrigeration, to solar, to biomass, to, to fuel cells, and we learn, and we, we learn from success, and we learn from failure, and being, having operations all over the world, we're testing continuously, and that allows us to go further and faster in the execution of new technologies, and also use our scale to drive down costs of new technologies. We did, we did that with a global bid on LED lighting, and now it's accessible, and we're including that in our new prototypes all over the world. Or we have the scale to buy energy from a full utility scale wind farm. In Mexico, we have six of them, and, they're, and we make that happen because of our scale and our credit rating, and that's exciting about how we can lead on environmental issues. And last but not least, as, as Doug mentioned, our capacity to convene, the power of partnerships, and to collaborate. We'll see several examples during the day of how we work with suppliers, with universities, with NGOs. It's a long journey, we cannot do it together, and it's exciting. Let me show, let me show a quick video of how we're making progress in the different areas. As one of the world's largest companies with global expanding presence, environmental problems are our problem. At Walmart, our environmental goals are simple and straightforward. To be supplied 100% by renewable energy. To create zero waste. To sell products that sustain people and the environment. We've made great progress and we're making an impact. In 2007, Walmart installed its first two renewable solar energy projects and began tracking its global renewable energy use. Today, thanks to this commitment, more than a quarter of our global electricity is generated from renewable sources, including wind, solar, hydro, and biogas. Walmart U.S. stores, clubs, distribution centers, and other facilities now divert more than 81.6% of waste from landfills. In 2014, Walmart and the Walmart Foundation joined forces with 10 supplier partners to launch the Closed Loop Fund, providing zero interest loans to U.S. cities to build recycling infrastructures and recycled content pipelines for manufacturers. As the world's largest grocer, Walmart is working to create a more sustainable food system, lowering the true cost of food through our commitment to sustainable beef, seafood, and agriculture. By working to ensure the products we sell are produced in sustainable and responsible ways, we are helping build supply chain capacity. We are committed to making sure healthier eating is easy and affordable and have saved customers $3.5 billion on fresh produce. 
Partnerships with suppliers are allowing us to reformulate food and increase transparency of product ingredients, removing trans fat and reducing sodium and sugar. Walmart is also working with our suppliers and other retailers to increase transparency of product ingredients for consumables. I believe, in fact, that being a good steward of the environment and of our communities and being an efficient and a profitable business are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they are one and the same. Walmart, save money, live better. One of the great things of sustainability is that it's a journey and there's always a higher mountain to climb and there's always a lot to do and partnerships are critical. Then we invite Michael Bender, Chief Operating Officer of the Global E-Commerce, to talk a little bit about what we're doing in California. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for joining uh, California has been a very important state in our sustainability journey and we have a few data points to share with you. Our first renewable energy projects were here in California. They were. Yep. Two stores with solar energy and a distribution center with a, with a one megawatt wind turbine. Right, yeah, so as you saw in the video, we did have uh, two stores that we started out with, uh, two projects that we started with in 2007. That was the beginning of the journey and we're sitting now with 188 solar projects across the state. Uh, that accounts for about 60% of our facilities here in, uh, in California, so we're really excited about that. Um, across the globe, 2,000 projects are actually powered by wind. And well, so that's, uh, that's really exciting for us on the journey that we're on. It is, it is, Michael. And you were here, was April of last year? Yes. President yes. Obama? Yeah. You played a critical, critical role in our, yep. in our event there. Can you talk to us a little sure. bit about that? Sure. That was a very exciting day for the associates in our store uh, there down in Mountain View, just a few miles south of uh, the location where we're standing now. Uh, President Obama used the stage there that day to start his vision and, and share his vision about uh, renewable energy and the future for that uh, for the country. Uh, we also took advantage of the opportunity to make an announcement about committing to doubling our renewable energy projects by the year 2020 in the U.S. At that Correct, time, it was a very very fun day for the company. And, and California has been on the leading edge in in our zero waste journey. Yep. We have diverted enough waste to cover. Alcatraz Island six times. Yes, we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good cocktail chit chat. Uh, just in one year. <laughs> right? Yeah. You share that with your friends. And that's just in one year. Yeah. So let, let me tell you a little bit more about that. That's 173,000 tons of diverted waste. Uh, California also ranks in the top 10 in uh, diversion of, uh, of, our, of our diverted waste, so we're good. Yep. Correct. And, and sourcing is critical in California. Yep. At least uh, about a third of Walmart's U.S. produce is sourced here from California. It is, yeah. And uh, California is one of the top states that uh, services our locally grown produce. Um, that's the commitment that we have to source more locally and bring those fresh products to our customers. So California really ends up being a great place for us. Uh, we source items like grapes, strawberries, citrus, and many other items, packaged salads as a result. And uh, we have a, a global sourcing office in Valencia, California that uh, we do a lot of our work out of. Uh, we work with local growers and uh, make sure that all of the produce that we bring in is uh, fresh and that we uh, are working with them directly. Um, the other thing that this group does is we spend a lot of time working with um, farmers in water stressed areas to figure out how to bring um, sustainably sourced water uh, through the process as well. Correct, Michael. Yep. And California is a great place to test new technologies and to pilot. Yep. We're always testing them here in California. We are, yeah. We have, uh, we have tests going on across the state right now on uh, issues like battery storage cells, um, fuel cells that we, uh, that we store energy in, um, electric charging stations at our store. In fact, that's, uh, you can find that at our Mountain View store uh, just south of here as well. So lots of really good activity going on across the state from a sustainability standpoint here. Thank you, thank you. Yep. There's still a lot to do here in California. And it takes all of us to drive innovation and to reshape the system, as Doug mentioned. And we have several Bay Area entrepreneurs here with us that will share some stories about the intersection of business and purpose and mission-led companies. So I'm honored to introduce John Battelle, co-founder of Wired Magazine and co-founder of Newco. So John, can you please come to stage? Welcome, thank you for being here. I, I don't have the little Walmart index card, so I'm at a big disadvantage. Um, 
and it's not often I get to speak in front of the largest company in the world, so I'll do my best, um, especially on a web cast as well. So I have notes. Um, <clears throat> I run a company called Nuco, um, and that's not a joke. It's actually the name of the company is Nuco. It is a new company. Um, <laughs> and hopefully 10 years from now, people won't complain about how we're now old, but um, certainly not 1962, um, which even predates me. Um, but Nuco started as an idea, and it was an idea uh, that was shared with me by someone in this room, Brian Monahan, um, who is over there, he said wave. Um, Brian was my co-founder in Nuco, and basically the, the idea came down to him pitching me. I said, wouldn't it be cool uh, if uh, interesting companies uh, in the Bay Area open their doors and let people come in and see what they were about? Very similar to what you're doing today. Um, and I said, yeah, that would be cool. I don't know how we'd do it exactly, but we ended up creating a business uh, about really interesting mission-driven companies who would open their doors and share their stories with the public. Um, and we've built a platform from that. Um, because what we noticed, and this was a few years back, is this typical Silicon Valley story of the hot, disruptive company with the upstart founder who was thumbing his nose at everybody. That story was changing. And what was changing about it was that the companies that were the most interesting were not necessarily companies that were just disruptive for being disruptive. It was that they were driven by a mission to create some kind of positive change in the world. And we thought creating a platform to celebrate that mission and those missions uh, would be a, a worthy thing. And Brian and I also noticed this wasn't true just for startups in sort of the hot internet and technology space. It was happening across the economy in transportation, retail, energy, healthcare, hospitality, every sector of our economy, these new mission-driven startups were, were being founded. And large companies were getting in on the act as well. Large brands were realizing they need to change their business practices, led, as we just heard, uh, by the Katrina um, uh, sort of epiphany uh, at Walmart, um, uh, that the customers were demanding a total cost uh, of goods purchased, not just a price cost. And that they were starting to understand that there was more involved in the transaction uh, than just whatever they received, that there was a supply chain and effect all through it. Um, so in order, I think every company needs a narrative, every company needs a story. Um, so I put together some ideas that I think are very large secular trends that are affecting business. Um, number one is the rise of the city. Um, this year, more than half of all of us live in major urban centers. But one generation from now, it will be two thirds. That's a massive shift in only one generation. And when people live in a concentrated place, you get more collisions between those people, hopefully positive ones. Um, you get more innovation and you get more company creation. Um, the next mega, sort of mega trend is what I call the um, purpose driven generational bridge. So you have on the one hand boomers. And boomers are staring at what? Mortality. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, what have I done in this life? Have I done anything I'm proud of? And often, and I'm sort of right at the trailing edge of the boomers, we say, I don't know that we've done enough. We want to find some reason that we can be proud of the legacy we've left. Now, on the other end, we've got the millennials, right? And the millennials are just entering the workforce, and they're saying, well, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Look at what we've got to deal with, you know. Thanks for the climate change ticket. Appreciate that. Um, and they are an incredibly positive group of people, and they want to affect change. Um, uh, some of the research I've done shown that three out of four millennials believe that companies they do business with should affect positive social change. Five years ago, the same group was uh, polled, and it was two out of four. So it went from 50% to 75% in five years. What happened in those five years? Millennials got a job. That's what happened. And they started being part of the economy and saying, wait a minute, how do I change the economy? The way I understand how to change it isn't necessarily through religion or government or education. It's through companies. And so they're affecting massive change in how companies understand society. Next, I think, and probably one of the largest forces uh, for, for all business is the uh, horizontal force of technology and the internet. 
um, the, the changes that have been wrought by technology. If you think about what happened when electricity came on board and how that changed business, it's similar to that. The data sharing, information, the cloud, technology is not a vertical industry anymore. It is a horizontal reality through all of our industries. Um, that has created the rise of another massive secular uh, shift, which is information transparency, which has already been called out several times from this stage. But the idea that people are now aware of and have access to the informational realities around a product they might consume means that they will change what products they consume based on knowing that information. And information generally wants to be free, it wants to be freely traded and shared. And we now have ways of doing that that we never had before. And last, and I, I don't want to make uh, too much of a bummer about this, but I think both the boomers and the millennials and everyone in between is very aware of climate change. And that becomes a business reality that we all need to get our arms around, that we all need to address, and it is driving significant business change. So we believe at NUCO that all businesses can be a force for positive change. And our mission is to identify them, celebrate them, and connect them. Um, and I can sort of sum up in the final story here what a NUCO is, what any company, and Walmart's going to participate in NUCO, we're excited in Silicon Valley uh, in a few months. Uh, any NUCO starts with, with this one question, which is, wouldn't it be cool if, right? And I've always noticed that great founders sort of tell their stories like, well, I was sitting there with a friend and we said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if all the world's information was organized and accessible? And then Google happens, right? Or wouldn't it be cool if there was an electric car that was like, faster and more powerful and better looking and just the same cost as all other luxury automobiles. And then wouldn't it be cool if we could do one that was sort of the same cost as a Honda and then Tesla gets born, right? Or wouldn't it be cool if instead of being kind of irritating and annoying, insurance companies were your friend and they provided you a Fitbit for your car and Metro Mile is born, right? So this kind of wouldn't it be cool if idea drives a lot of the mission-driven companies uh, that we see happening, not just here in the Valley. Nuco is now in 15 markets around the world, including Istanbul, Amsterdam, um, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. This is happening in all sorts of cities. And it's similar, I think, what you've seen with Walmart, just it's spreading around the world, we hope. Wouldn't it be cool? <laughs> um, so we also ask a question about the very nature of work itself. You know, wouldn't it be cool if work wasn't a place you had to go to. Wouldn't it be cool if work was a place you wanted to go to? Um, and so we celebrate companies like that, and this is certainly one of them. And we've got three more that are here to talk to us a bit about uh, their experiences starting companies. And I'd like to invite them up to the stage. So Adam Vollmer, C CEO of Faraday Bicycles, uh, Kirsten Toby, co-founder of Revolution Foods, and Andy Rubin, who you've met before, the co-founder of Yertle. So welcome them, please. So maybe I'll ask you guys to do this little bit with me. Um, can you tell your wouldn't it be cool if story uh, as a way of introducing folks as to the uh, missions of your companies? Let's start with you. Uh, OK, so I'm, I'm Adam, uh, the founder and CEO of Faraday Bicycles. We make electric bikes. Um, yeah, so our wouldn't it be cool story uh, was, wouldn't it be cool if electric bikes could make it so that instead of half a percent of our population biking to work, which is where we're at now, we could have 10% of our population biking to work. What would that look like for health and environment and social uh, congestion and other things? So yeah, that's us. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Kirsten? Um, so at Revolution Foods, our, our wouldn't it be cool if story was, you know, we, my co-founder and I sat and said, wouldn't it be cool if all kids had access to the highest quality of food that they deserve? And um, so we you know, said, wouldn't it be cool if, if healthy food was also the food that kids were you know, reaching for, and um, if the healthiest food was also the most delicious and, and tasty food and the most accessible food. Wow. Hello, uh, Andy Rubin with Yertle. And our Yertle, wouldn't it be cool story was, you know, the average house right now in the U.S. has 300,000 items in it. It's a lot of items. It's actually two to three times the number of SKUs in a super center. And so our wouldn't be cool is, wouldn't it be cool if we could make better use of the items that we've already made? In addition to making items better, let's get two, three, four uses out of those existing items. 
300,000 items in a household. I had no idea. It's amazing. Um, so you all have very, these are big missions to, to, that would affect significant change. But for example, with an, a, 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 an electric bike, your bicycle, I noticed, because I thought about getting one, because they're super cool. But they're also like $2,500. <laughs> 3500 30, Oh, $3,500, sorry. <laughs> What's well, a thousand bucks between friends? Um, <laughs> but for you, John. <laughs> so, uh, how does how, how do you how is that going to scale? So, so we get asked that a, a lot, right? That that's a common question. Um, in, in my answer to that, I actually tell a, a tale of two car stories. So, you mentioned Tesla earlier, a company we all know. Um, another company you, you probably don't know is a company called Coda Automotive. So, Coda and Tesla, two car companies, make electric cars. Uh, Tesla launched with a $120,000 beautiful looking super fast sports car. Coda launched with a $40,000 boring sedan. Today Tesla is kind of on this rocket ship trajectory to success and, and getting to that $40,000 price point and, and Coda's gone. Um, and the lesson I take away from that is when you want to really disrupt a category and be innovative and start something new, you have to build quality and uh, desire into the product, into the brand and experience kind of from the outset. Um, and, and that's where we're at. That's why we've started where we're at right now. You have to, at the same token, if you want to have impact, if you want to have that vision of really being transformative, have that vision of where you're going to go. So where are you going to take it? And that's why Tesla is building that car that I'm going to buy in a couple of years. So you have the Tesla of bicycles. So we would love to have the Tesla of bicycles, right? <laughs> um, and, that's, and we're doing It this. is a pretty cool bike, I have to say. It's a cool bike. Yeah. And this year we're launching a couple that are going to be at much lower price points. So we built the platform, and then you scale that out. So speaking of scale, how, Christian, do you scale, well, I have two questions. One, how do you scale these, th this goal? And, and two, how do you get kids to eat, to eat, to eat the, you know, healthy foods? Um, so, I mean, the, the first thing is we don't necessarily go and, and, you know, tell kids, this is the healthy food, you've got to eat it. We've, we go and we, you know, when we first started, we went and we talked to kids and we said, well, what do you want to see in your... Um, we, we started out in school lunchrooms. We said, what do you want to see in your school lunchroom? And, and across the board, kids said, well, not this, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever it was that they were being served. And so we saw a huge opportunity to, to you know, listen to kids and hear what they wanted to hear. And, and over and over again, we heard kids who were like, well, I want to be a chef when I grow up. And, and I really like, you know, tasting new things. And, and if only the people making the food respected me. And that was sort of the moment where we were like, you know what, if we can make food, with you know a team of bring together some of the you know some great chefs who know how to make food from you know the sort of scratch made techniques that that you know food is meant to be made with and make it in a way that you know kids can give us feedback and taste test and and um, you know try and, and make it with respect for what kids think and what they um, you know what they're accustomed to. So we you know really focus on culturally appropriate menus in the regions that we're in. We're in we're in seven different regions around the country, including you know Texas and Louisiana and and uh, New Jersey, New York and D.C. and as well as California and Colorado. And and each of those regions has its own needs. It also has you know. They're, they're also you know, ubiquitous favorites amongst kids. Um, but really bringing kind of chef crafted, a chef crafted approach back into the school um, meal arena in a way that operationally works for schools has been you know, the, the way that we've started out. And, and we focused on scalability from day one. We wanted to make sure that our meals were reimbursable under the federal um, school meal guidelines so that, so that kids who come from low income families can, can eat our meals for free at school. Um, and so, you know, 80% of the kids that eat our, our school meals qualify for a free and reduced price lunch. Um, and then we also decided, you know, we had to go beyond the school lunchroom. We have families saying, hey, it's, it's great that my kid's eating this great, you know, lunch and sometimes breakfast at school, but can we also, you know, access your food in, in other ways? And so that launched us into the, into the retail arena. And we now have a retail product line that's, um, you know, still in its in nascent stages. We're in our second year. Um, with a consumer packaged good, but it's but you know we're we're launching that as a way to bring the same quality of food that we've brought into schools for the last eight years now into into families' kitchens and families' homes. Um, so we're now in, in the school side of what we do. We're serving uh, 1.5 million meals a week in these 25 cities across the country, um, and we now have you know a, a small but growing retail product line as well, where we're we're you know really trying to 
meet the needs of families that are busy and, and you know don't necessarily have time to be making all the food that they that they would you know ideally want to be making or that their grandmothers had time to make when when kids were young, um, but make it in a really you know affordable and accessible way. And accessibility to us has to do with you know both the channel through which it's distributed. So schools is a is a huge vehicle for access, um, but when it comes to retail, it's you know making sure that it's in the most accessible retail stores as well. Um, Andy, uh, the goal that Yertle has, um, how do you square that goal with sitting here? Um, I, I'm asking that question not as a challenge, but really it's an interesting thing. I mean, you worked at Walmart, but your idea is that less stuff gets sold, isn't it? Yeah, I don't see the two as incongruous. You know, so the, the idea of, of a retailer, at least in my belief, right, is serving serving customers, it's everything that we've just been talking about. And so in serving customers, you know, increasingly consumer trends happen fast, right? If I were to tell you that if we were sitting here four years ago and I would say that the fastest growing company in the world was a company that you got in a car with a stranger, <coughs> right? Or the, the largest hotel chain in the world was a hotel chain that you, you know, my last two hotel stays were in someone's home. That would be odd. But you look at the consumer trend with the kind of enabled mobile devices that we have and these ability to connect. So serving customers and helping them save money, reuse is a part of that. And so the ability to make reuse a part of that on a mission, you know, one of the things from the outside I think people don't realize is how strong Walmart's mission is for saving customers money. And there's still plenty of new items to be sold, but it can be done in a way that as these consumer trends evolve, it's very consistent with including reuse as a part of that. So I don't find those, I don't find those at odds. All of your stories, um, you go beyond whatever the product or service it is that you actually provide, a lunch or a bicycle or, or the, a platform for reuse. You really are talking about some systemic change. You, you noted, Kirsten, that the first thing people, the kids said was uh, the environment, the people that respect me. Um, so how much of your work is, is not about the product you're making, but about the work you have to do systemically, uh, as Doug put it? Uh, for us, it's a, it's a huge part of it. I mean, our, our, our mission is to build lifelong healthy eaters. It's not to sell food products. So, we're, so when, when we you know, create a new program or we enter a new school or we you know, enter a new city, it's, it's, we, we do as much work around the community, around families, around you know, making sure that our, that our food is designed in a way that it is setting up kids to have healthy eating habits, you know, whether that's because it's encouraging them to taste and try new things, which is a really important part of, of building healthy eating habits, or if it's you know, because we're involving families in, a, you know, in cooking lessons so that families can, can do more around you know, bringing fresh, healthy food onto the, the dinner table in the, um, in the evening, because we know it's not just about it's not just about getting a food, you know, getting some great food product into a kid's mouth and into their belly. It's about the whole story behind that food for the family as well as for the kid, and so that they're, you know, set up for for building a, a lifelong healthy eating kind of trajectory. Is that true also for your business that you're doing as much education and rethinking through the system as you are making bikes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your question again about cost, right? I mean, one thing that we're doing is having a conversation with people about what are the real costs of transportation, right? So a lot of people just kind of take it for granted that, that we should all own a car. Owning a, owning a mid-sized family sedan costs, according to Consumer Reports, $5,000 a year. So there's massive, massive financial, uh, social health uh, costs to, to the way we think of the status quo of transportation. So, so we try to educate around that. We try to inform people. We try to have conversations with businesses like Walmart, right, who are progressive in looking at the ways they can be leaders in that conversation. Uh, and find ways to engage them to get their employees or their customers into kind of healthier, more sustainable behaviors and habits and stuff. And I think in a lot of ways, we find employers are more receptive to that because I think they're a little more attuned sometimes to what those costs actually are. They pay for insurance, they pay for parking lots. Right. Um, and we've been really happy to have some great conversations there. Great. Final thought? Yeah, I think just in, in response to the question about how much of the system change, I think one thing with any, any of the changes that succeed they, um, it's very difficult for them to take on the entire system and create a business. So I think that the businesses have to be started in a concept that is happening anyway, right? So the concept that we see at Yertle, you know, we, we had 200,000 items last year that we kept in play and this year we're on track for a million. 
and you see the growth in that, it's because people save so much money, right? When they can get an item by exposing one of the items they're not using, right? So it's, these, are, these are big trends. And then I think what, what can happen, either with ideas or small companies, is they fit within that bigger change. Mm -hmm. And they play a role in that. They accelerate it. But I think it's very difficult for any entity to actually change the arc of where things are going. Well, please uh, join me in thanking these three entrepreneurs for coming here today. Thank you, guys. Good morning. How are you guys? Good morning. Good to be here today. Thank you to the panelists. That was a great panel. And Andy Rubin, it is great to see you. Love your story. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about wouldn't, uh, our Wouldn't It Be Cool moment and share with you kind of how we got started on this journey. So my name is Laura Phillips, and I've been with Walmart 20 years, mostly as a merchant, about 10 of that working in sustainability. And I'm thrilled to take on a new assignment helping us look after our uh, omni-channel assortment strategy. And with me today is Sheila Bonini. And Sheila, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sheila Bonini. I'm the CEO of the Sustainability Consortium. We're a, an independent nonprofit organization, but most people know us as the uh, power behind Walmart Sustainability Index. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, All right, well, we're going to sit down and have a couple minutes of just a talk about kind of where we are today, how we got here, and then set it up for kind of what we're announcing later on, which is really cool and so exciting to be here with you guys today who helped create really what's next in our Wouldn't It Be Cool moment. So let me take you back about 10 years ago. Uh, and as we started this journey, as Doug mentioned, and we thought about what could we do, wouldn't it be cool if? And in fact, some of these moments would happen with Andy Rubin and I, where we'd go across the street from uh, Bentonville Home Office. Uh, who's been to Jimmy John's out there? And uh, we'd go about once a week, and we'd get a napkin, right, Andy? And we'd talk about, well, wouldn't it be cool if? And we thought, uh, as a merchant, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could sell great product that uh, we knew was highly rated based on science? validated with great metrics uh, that our buyers could then use to make the right decisions. Customers were telling us they wanted more sustainable products, uh, but we weren't sure how to do it. So wouldn't it be cool if we could tell our customers, this is a great product. It is backed by science. It's validated by industry. We've sat with our suppliers. We've engaged all of our stakeholders. We've leveraged our expertise in the supply chain. And we've really used data to help make those decisions about the products we're sorting. And we thought that was a neat vision. And it's so interesting. and exciting and a proud moment for me to be here 10 years later and share with you about how now that wouldn't it be cool moment for Walmart is really coming to life. We knew we couldn't do this by ourselves. This was really complicated from seafood to apparel to toys to electronics. We needed help. We also needed data. And that's where the sustainability consortium came in, Sheila. And really what we've been able to accomplish with your help is amazing. So why don't you talk a little bit okay. about how you helped us solve our challenge. Yeah, and any of you that won't ask more questions, I have a couple brochures for the, those of you who are more technical, want to see some of what we do. But uh, the consortium really um, was started about five years ago. I think there were some sort of early uh, convenings prior to that. But the idea behind the consortium was that bringing together a group of multi-stakeholders, so we've got academics, NGOs, and corporate members, and developing something that was based on science. So the idea of the science is uh, uh, the understanding of what really are the sustainability impacts for a given product that really matter, right? So not the sustainability thing of the, of the, of the flavor of the month, but really what matters for this product in terms of its sustainability. So what we do at the Sustainability Consortium is we provide that underlying science. So we figure out for any given product category, what are the key sustainability impacts? And not just the sort of typical environmental ones we think of of water and waste and carbon, but the social issues like labor and community rights and human health and even animal welfare. So we cover the gamut of sustainability impacts. And we find out what the science says first. And one of the problems with science, though, is sometimes it's not practical. So that's where our network of stakeholders, we have over 100 members, and they're in academia, but mostly they're NGOs and corporate members and even um, government uh, entities as well. Um, who help us take that science that says kind of here's the key, we call them hot spots, but here are the things that matter for this product and these are the kinds of improvement opportunities that you could do. 
And then we work with our stakeholders to vet that and make it more practical and usable. And we create indicators. So essentially, Walmart's index is based on a survey. Well, we create that survey, those questions that the suppliers answer to be able to understand how sustainable those products are. But we do it based in science, so we know we're asking the right questions. We have this multi-stakeholder uh, uh, network, so we know we're vetting those and making them practical. Um, and then we're taking a life cycle approach. So we're looking at not just those impacts that matter, but where in the system are they happening? So whether that's back at the farm level, or whether that's in a factory, or whether that's um, you know, in the manufacturing site. So we're able to then point to those impacts. And what really we're trying to do, yes, we're trying to drive more sustainable consumer products, but really what we're trying to do is we're trying to drive the conversation. We want at the retail level the conversation to be asking their suppliers, and then the suppliers to be talking with their suppliers, so that this conversation is happening and we're beginning to focus on the right things, where they matter in the supply chain. And that's really what we're aiming for and what we're trying to do. That's great. So let me talk to you a little bit about how we're using your toolkit. Yeah. So uh, after five years, Walmart now, we have three years of data that we've had over 13 suppliers enter in their information using the, the, the scorecard. It produces an index. It's really a scorecard for our buyers and for our suppliers. It's on a 100-point scale. So it's really easy when a buyer has a meeting with a supplier to go into our system, print out the scorecard. It's very easy, red, yellow, green, to take into the supplier meeting and say, supplier X, we see you're ranking first here, but last here. How can we work on this together? And what we love about the index and how we've used the science to help inform our decisions is that then it creates a race to the top. And it's all about our engagement with our suppliers, helping them to move farther ahead. And when they improve their product, we're excited about it. Our customers are excited about it. We sell more, and it really creates kind of a, an advantage for us. So we've just really loved having the data and the science coming in through, validated through the stakeholder engagement process through the sustainability consortium that then turns into an index that then our merchants take to really bring customers the great uh, notion of sustainability for all. So a, one story I had to bring an item today is a cup. And this cup is an example of how our buyer, uh, Jason Rogers, uh, used the index and said with his supplier, Aladdin Products, and I think you're in the room today, um, post-consumer recycled goods is important. This is a reuse example, Andy. Um, and it matters to Walmart. And so they saw in the index that they could uh, take uh, hangers, in fact, it tells on the back, hangers from our apparel uh, in our stores and they're going to be making this in Kentucky. It was made in China in, uh, out of virgin pro uh, polypropylene. Now it's going to be made in Kentucky out of recycled goods from our hangers. And we're going to be selling this uh, cup uh, in our stores this fall and also in a multi-pack online. And it's just one example of a buyer making a difference with a supplier to bring change in the, su in the supply chain in a way that's uniquely Walmart. So what's next in terms of uh, the consortium and uh, the index? Well, we have a lot uh, that's next, but I have to say what's so exciting is exactly that. We want to have the conversation happen. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to get to see our metrics you know, being used live. But I think a lot of what we're doing now is uh, what we call uh, implementation. So to get that kind of systemic change, we need to work with Walmart and other retailers on using the metrics that we have to have those conversations. But we also need to work with the suppliers on how, how do they digest this, how do they provide the data, and how do they work with their supply chains. So we've been doing sessions, for example, where we work with some of the suppliers and grower groups, right, who are their suppliers, to help them understand and have this conversation. So we're doing a lot of that work, and it's very exciting. We're also hopeful that the um, metrics we're providing uh, grow for the whole consumer goods industry. So not just Walmart, but we have other retailers who are piloting and using our metrics. And that, of course, creates greater efficiency. All the suppliers will be answering the same questions. All of us will be focused on the same issues uh, in the supply chain where they matter. That's so, great. Well, thanks for the time. And that really what we wanted to share is the foundation, how we got here through the sustainability consortium, how we got here through the index. You're going to learn more about what other suppliers are doing at Walmart and Sam's Club and Walmart.com. And then you're going to see really what we're unveiling today is the future that this group at e-commerce is helping us take this to the next level. So thank you. And Dan, we'll transition it to you. Thank you.
Good morning. Great to be with you. That's uh, incredible work that's being done, and it's really focused on across the board. It's really building trust with our customers. And I think about the conversation Doug had about the history that Walmart, the kind of the journey we've been on as a company. And it started with having what was considered maybe a narrow interpretation of who our universe with customers and our associates, and that we had to broaden the lens. What's interesting, though, is that it comes back full circle because it's our customers and it's our associates that are demanding us to look at uh, sustainability in a different way. The expectations that have been placed on us by our customers. And so the work that we're doing with the index helps gain that trust um, with our customer. Their, their expectations are, are growing when it comes to visibility into the supply chain. Where do our products come from? As Doug talked about, who's actually developing those products or manufacturing those products? All those things are factoring into a customer's decision as to whether they're going to shop our store. And increasingly, it's, it's factoring into, as Neil talked about, into whether somebody's going to choose to work for us. So it all has come full circle what those, what viewed as a very narrow universe of stakeholders um, are raising their game of expectations as well. But I want to talk about today, um, our, is bring it to the stage here shortly, are some suppliers who are helping leverage the index and in showing how we can work hand in hand because our relationship with our suppliers is vital. And uh, many of them start, some of them are big, some of them are small. Um, I must say, I was, it was really great to hear your stories. Uh, I don't have an electric bike, you've intrigued me. Um, I can say as a, as a direct focus group, I have dear friends of mine whose kids go to O. Henry Middle School in Austin, Texas, and absolutely love the food. Um, and I've got four boys, so we're totally into reuse. <laughs> I can tell you that much. <laughs> But right now, I want to I introduce some suppliers of ours. First, Jason Foster, who is CEO and co-founder of Replenish. Please welcome him to the stage. <laughs> Ryan Slate, head of sales and marketing at Intex. And Jonathan Atwood, who's VP of sustainability at Unilever. Please help us welcome. Thank you. Have a seat, gentlemen. Thank you. Let me start with you, Jason, and, yes. and talk about um, what has the sustainability index meant for your business. Maybe tell a little bit about your business. You're a passionate advocate of it, um, yes. and and how we've worked together using the index. Well, it's it's really been an inspiration for us, and even back when you announced the supplier index back in 2006, around right. this idea of that what goes into the product, the packaging, how it's created is really going to matter one day. And I'm holding a, a bottle of Replenish here, which is really founded on this simple idea of what if there was a reusable bottle that I could use that had a really interesting design that made it easy for me to use liquid concentrates. And this was this innovation that happened that we said, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Because you could, most of the products that we buy today are over 90% water in consumer products. So we're using a lot of plastic and a lot of ways to move that water around. But if there was a design that we could really empower consumers to be able to do that themselves, to save money, to create a tremendous reduction in the footprint of the amount of plastic and energy and, and, and greenhouse gas emissions, would really be this transformative thing. So thanks to Walmart, Walmart took that idea and helped us empower and create a new line of cleaners called Clean Path that's at Walmart that uses this replenished bottle and is really taking this idea and bringing it to mainstream consumers and homes where people can create this, these products themselves, save money, and really fulfill that promise of less waste. So it's been tried at quite a tremendous inspiration How for are us. sales? Okay. You know, they're good. What we're seeing is that when you put this sort of technology into people, you're seeing that they, they have these new benefits that they didn't know they could find. Uh, it's convenience. It's this aspect of, right. wow, you're empowering people. They like to be a part of it. Right. So it's challenging that status quo. And innovation does that. And it's these moments we get to have is, wouldn't it be cool if I could do that? And thanks to Walmart, you know, they're bringing some of these ideas and, and, and empowering it. And so um, it's, it's been great. a great inspiration. Ryan, why don't you talk a little bit about Intex and how you're using the Index working with Walmart? Sure, great. Thanks for being here. Um, we're a manufacturing marketing company globally that uh, has been in business for about 50 years. Uh, we're a lead supplier in plastics, above ground swimming pools, inflatable pool toys, new portable spas, and our growing category is air beds. Um, we, uh, we take efficiency um, to our core because we're a family owned business. Um, we set out with Walmart GS about five years ago to look at different programs. We started with Six Sigma, but then that transitioned very quickly into new energy efficiency programs. And we were one of 10 pilot manufacturers in China to adopt a new program from Walmart called Red E, which basically 
tailored, customized solutions for our particular product, our factories, to really take a look at our energy efficiency. And I'm happy to report this year that we'll save roughly 7 million kilowatt hours in energy usage on an annual basis. And that's about $1.5 million in cost, which is pretty significant, and it'll power about 1,000 U.S. households on an annual basis. And we looked at things from big projects to small projects. Obviously, $7 million is a lot, uh, but it took a lot of little things to basically add up to that amount. We reprogrammed all of our electronic welding machines. We basically fused plastic together. And by doing so, we were able to save two and a half million kilowatt hours just in that reprogramming efforts to make those machines more efficient. We took a look at our injection molding factory from top to bottom. We changed the lights, we changed the ventilation, we changed some machines, um, and we really utilized better cavity capacity within our, our molds. Um, three and a half million uh, kilowatt hour savings there. But we did a lot that were a couple hundred thousand here, a couple hundred thousand there. Um, that took a substantial investment from a company, but we're very, very happy with the outcome that we can save on an annual basis. That's pretty significant. And then we've also moved, some, moved the needle on our, uh, our carbon footprint or our greenhouse gas reduction by changing out all of our old diesel boilers into new natural gas uh, equipment. We were basically able to reduce our, our carbon footprint by 30%, which is pretty significant. That's fantastic. Jonathan, Unilever is a, is a real champion and, and leader in sustainability. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, a little bit about your history uh, within the journey that your company's been on, but also how the index has helped leverage uh, taking it to the next level. Yeah, happy to. I, uh, I want to congratulate Walmart for this great meeting. And uh, during that, that Katrina story, I was starting to think about Hurricane Sandy and, and, and a very similar effect it had on us on, on the East Coast at Unilever. So. Well done on that, and I, and I think it kind of drives to the to the broader narrative for Unilever. You know, we're we're in year five of the of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. We have 50 time-bound targets. We have three big goals. We're making progress. We think, you know, our corporate purpose is all about making sustainable living commonplace, not for not for some, not and not for others. It's it's all about everybody getting into this conversation, which is why this meeting is so important. Um, for us, the index is is. Is so beautifully aligned to what we're trying to do as an organization. We use the tools, the mapping, the hotspots within the index to drive within Unilever down into procurement, down into the supply chain, down into R&D, so that we have we, we have a way to look at our business and 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 make improvements. We love the scorecard. We we do fairly well on the scorecard, but we have room to improve, quite honestly. And the whole idea about the index is about continuous improvement. Uh, we're not perfect by a long way. But the index gives us a sense as to where we stand and what we need to work on. And that's really important to us. And the other thing, quite honestly, and, and perhaps most importantly, is that the index has led us into a, into a much uh, deeper thinking around collaboration. And you know, we're, we're now in three with Walmart um, that, are, that are pretty significant, one around sustainable uh, agriculture and soybeans and field to market. And that's all coming together quite well. The closed loop fund, uh, which has been, you know, I believe, will be transformational. It, we're, we're getting to a point now where some announcements will be made, and that's, and that's really great. And the most recent beauty and, and personal care summit around chemicals of concern, the pre-competitive conversation and collaboration being led and kind of and, and, and harmonized through the index, we think is, is the way forward. Because at Unilever, our belief is no systemic change will happen by one company alone. We, we, you know, we don't do it that way at Unilever. We, we always seek, seek out partners. We seek out uncommon collaborations. Um, and we move forward that way. Yeah, the, the type of collaboration you're talking about a few years ago even would not would be unheard of. Right. Uh, but I think people have seen how it can unlock a lot of uh, potential for for industries and in, in, in a pre-competitive way, as you said. Let's talk about customers. Um, and I'll throw this out to whoever like to take the take the bait here. Um, mostly, we talk about environmental products or sustainable products, and we think about quickly to millennials. Right. But can you disabuse of that? I, I tend to think that this probably has a much broader applicability than just millennials, or, or is it? Is it is it tailored to a certain customer? Yeah, it, this is something I'm very passionate about. If you think about the conversation we have today and how interconnected our lives are, that we're taking sustainability and connecting it to making the most out of what we have. And when we start doing that, that brings out the good that we all feel that we should do, that, that we're naturally programmed to have. And I think it, it brings into being good neighbors and us getting the most out of what's there. So we're, that's, that's universal. 
And as what, I, what I'm so hopeful about this movement is because Walmart is helping bringing this to connecting it to saving money which opens it up to even so many more people that can start to feel that, wait, I'm making the most out of what I have. I'm being a good neighbor. I'm cognizant of these things. It just it allows it to grow in ways that it's not just for one group. It's not just for one demographic to participate in. We all can participate in that. And that's something that we see from generations before us, great civilizations. You're always judged by, do you make the most out of what you have? And we're starting to have those conversations. We're starting to see that. And I think that there's no limit to how far we can take it, thanks to what Walmart's doing. That's great. Yeah, I would like to echo, uh, I think that uh, every responsible company has a commitment to the environment as well as operating more efficiently. And certainly the collaboration uh, that we talked about is there with Walmart. Uh, we're uniquely positioned uh, as one supplier within the plastics category that can recycle or return products to China. Um, we use it in uh, regrind of our own uh, product line, our pool covers and ground cloths. Um, and we also look at QAQC um, as far as our, what we're doing to improve our products. Um, we, uh, we return about 400 containers annually um, for a total amount of roughly 13,000 tons of PVC. Not enough to cover Alcatraz, um, but we'll certainly look at that uh, fact going forward. But I think it's important to everybody that touches um, the product, whether it's in the design elements, the distribution, certainly the financing and the manufacturing of the product, but then consumers, whether you're young or old. My boss happens to be in his older years, and this is near and dear to his heart with regards to what kind of footprint, what kind of legacy is he leaving for the next generation, um, which includes on his family and his, uh, his children and his children's children. I would just echo what Jason was saying, because I, I, at Unilever, it's all about mainstreaming, right? Yeah. We want this conversation to be a mainstream conversation and not about the have and have nots or be about price or out, you know, out pricing for, for certain consumers. We want to make this conversation about easy, accessible, where's the information, Can, you know, is the company a acting in an authentic way, are we showing where we have gaps and that we're, we're, where we can move forward together. And you know, I, think, I think it's going to come down to us collectively kind of closing this gap that seems to be out there with what consumers say they, they do and what they actually do. And how do we narrow that gap? And I think it's going to come down to kind of more granular insights about what are, what are consumers or customers looking for? Who are they going to trust? You know, we, we, we're designing against, we hope that at some point, the U on our, on our packaging is the trust mark for sustainable living. You see the U, you know that company, you know that Unilever is at, on the path, on the journey, is, is looking after consumers and will make it kind of a built-in without the extra cost. Well, and, and it's innovation. Right? We have to have innovation that yeah. helps influence these conversations. I, I came up with this idea for Replenish over an ironing board in 2006. Mm -hmm. I had no background in being an engineer or a designer or nothing. And it came from this epiphany, this moment of, well, there's a lot of water in these products. What if there was a tool that Wouldn't made it, it cool? easier for me? Wouldn't, Wouldn't it, be it be cool? cool? So it allowed this to happen. And here I am as an individual, you know, so many years later, being able to bring this innovation because Walmart will take and find ideas, even if they come from an ironing board, right? <laughs> to create this innovation and, and help show that there are these new paths that we can start unlocking mm -hmm. this value, eliminating waste, saving money for people. And that is something that we can all be passionate about. Ryan, you're going to get to pitch your product. I know Jason's pitched oh, it twice, so I'm you. going to pull this out so you can tell everybody about this. Certainly, we believe in innovation as well. Um, and one of the things, obviously, we're in the PVC business, but we always look at ways to uh, reduce our PVC usage, but still provide value and, uh, and benefit to the end consumer. Um, and we created a brand new patented technology called FiberTech, which basically, and I know the cameras won't get it, but you can certainly come up and take a look at my um, either dog bed or um, doll bed. This is just a mini version um, that I brought We're to the stage. stage. Dive on that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but basically, if you take a look at it, it's almost like a piano string approach to the brand new construction. It reduces about uh, 10 to 15 percent of the PVC, but it's more durable, it's more comfortable, and it's a better benefit as well as reduced weight, reduced cube, um, and a much better uh, overall category. And I'm happy to say that Walmart's selling about a couple million of these on an annual right. basis, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation. We really appreciate your leadership. Obviously, our partnership is one that, uh, that we value sincerely, and we will in the future. So please, everyone, help us uh, thank these great suppliers. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a video. Janae 
Renee Peterson from GreenYourDecor.com and GreenAndGorgeous.net. To me, sustainability means paying very close attention to the things I buy, where they came from, how they were made. We really have changed so many things about our lifestyle. We recycle, we try to use natural light when we can. Sustainability is important because I have children and I want to make sure that the planet is around for them. Right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks again for coming out to California for this meeting. So proud today. Um, I'm Kelly Thompson. I work here at Global E-Commerce within the Category Development um, Group. And I'm super excited when I was uh, thinking about what I was going to say today. It gave me a chance to reflect on just how far we've come along on this journey. I mean, wow. And we have so many people to thank um, and appreciate for all of the hard work. You heard Laura and Sheila talk about all of the hard work that, was gone, that has gone on to build the sustainability index. I mean, that was massive. I mean, I remember talking about that five years ago. What are we going to do with that? And I'll share you a little bit later with what we are going to do with that. We heard about the partnership with our suppliers who share their sustainable practices with us so that we can actually recognize the leaders. That's actually pretty amazing. And like Dan said, with all of the group up here, we work with our suppliers on this so that our customers don't have to. And we get to see our suppliers do some really cool things in the process, like take millions of our used hangers and turn them into coffee tumblers. That's very cool. Um, today, we're up excited to update you on our commitment to build a platform for customers to learn about and easily buy from sustainable brands. So this is a big deal, and we're very excited. So last year, we talked to a group of Walmart moms, you saw one of them in the videos, and they told us in no uncertain terms that we need to make sustainability easy for them and for their families. And so today, we're taking the first step to help our customers identify which brands and suppliers are leading the way in sustainability so they can shop with a purpose. The sustainability leader shop on walmart.com rewards companies who are making commitments and leading in sustainability, and it helps in our efforts to sell more products that sustain people and the environment, one of our big three goals. And I'm going to invite Brian Monahan to come up here and show you exactly what I'm talking about. So why don't you uh, take it away, and I'll come back up and close, Brian. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Okay. Well, you know, Kelly, as you well know, our, our mission at Walmart is to help people save money so they can live better. And we do that by... We try to make it easy for our customers by providing access to a broad assortment of goods and services at everyday low prices, conveniently accessible in multiple ways through our super centers, our neighborhood market, store pickup, home delivery, e-commerce. And as Kelly mentioned and we saw in the video, our customers have also told us they want, to, they want our help to make it easier to shop consciously, to put their money where their heart is. And using the flexibility of e-commerce, We've started building these stores within a store. We call them stores for good internally. We, we launched a, a storefront for women-owned uh, uh, businesses a couple years ago. Last year, we did a major reboot of our Made in America store, and our sales year on year have shown phenomenal growth. So this isn't just about doing good. This is good business. So without further ado, I want to walk you through what the new uh, sustainability leaders uh, store on walmart.com looks like. We didn't dare risk a live demo, but I invite you all to pull out your phone, go to walmart.com slash sustainability leaders and, and, and follow along. So, uh, so this is, this is the, uh, the homepage of the store. The headline says, make it easier to save money today for a better tomorrow. And there's ways to learn more about the initiative uh, throughout the site, but really we want to make a, a utility to help our customers shop. And you can see here on the left-hand nav the different uh, categories. And if we scroll down uh, a little bit further, We've got the thousands of qualified SKUs organized into, into eight different categories here. So these are all SKUs made by the sustainable leaders, the companies that have, uh, are leading their categories per the sustainability index from the consortium. We've got them conveniently organized here into different shoppable categories. I'm going to come back to this in a second. If you go down a little bit further, what you can see is more information about the Sustainability Leader Badge, so you can learn more again about the program. And if you go down further still, here's where we're showcasing the, the uh, great suppliers who are helping lead the, the charge on sustainable initiatives. And so we're rotating through different uh, suppliers here. With, uh, you can click on it, you can play a video and learn more about um, what they're doing uh, inside their companies. So, 
let's, uh, let's walk through it as if we were a customer. So let's say I'm a, I'm a Walmart customer. I, uh, I get an email or I come to the site and I see uh, information about the sustainability leader store. I'm like, interesting, I'm gonna go check it out. I click through and voila, I land here. I'm go, okay, this looks kind of interesting. Um, I've got to do some. I've got to do some stocking up on my my household needs. I'm going to click on household and pets, and I'm going to click through there. So if I click through. Now I'm landing uh, one level deeper, and you can see on the departments here the the different categories we have within within a household and, and pets. I'm like, okay, interesting. Sounds like there's something to this, but I I really want to understand what this is all about. Because one of the things we've, we've learned is that third party validation is really key to having credibility with the customer in this area. So if I click on learn more, I'm actually gonna, it'll launch another window in my browser. And here I can come through and actually start to learn more about the sustainability initiative at Walmart. Um, and in particular about household and pets. And, and actually if, I, if you scroll down a little bit, now you can actually get even more details at the specific um, product level. So if we go and say, all right, well, what about laundry detergent? I really want to understand laundry detergent. If click on that. Now that's actually going to pull up a one page from the sustainability consortium that goes through exactly how that category was evaluated. So I can learn more, feel confident about what's, um, how this assortment was curated. But, you know, I'm a busy Walmart customer. I got to get my kids off to soccer practice. I got to cut the oranges. I got stuff to do. I got to knock this out. So let's go back and let's go shopping. So right, I'm back here. I'm click back out. I need some detergent. I'm going to go to the laundry room. I'll click on that. Pull up all my favorite brands. I'm going to scroll down. Look for the brand that I trust and want to buy. Okay, there it is. Tide on rollback, $9.94, the great Walmart price. Open the, uh, the item page and I can add it to my cart and it's simple as that and, and I'm on my way. And what's exciting about uh, this is, is making it easy for the customer to shop, but also threading this through our core experience. Um, and you know, Kelly, as you come back up to help us close this session, just, I just wanted to flag the, the badge there uh, on the item page so that our customers can learn more and discover these things throughout the site. So, so check it out, demo the site, it's live now. We'd love to hear your feedback. And, uh, and, and we're excited to, to do good by doing good business. Awesome, that was very cool. So show of hands, who's gonna check out the site? We need to drive traffic. Yeah. A few more hands, there we go. Right. Um, that was awesome and um, you know, it's, I'm really proud to stand here today and you, Brian, being a driving force is bringing this to life. Um, you know, until now, all of the hard work on the sustainability index has gone on behind the scenes, made it clear to merchants, but now we're actually inviting customers into this conversation um, and they can see how important this work, um, you know, how this important work is getting done and they can understand more and it also gives them greater control over how they spend their hard earned money. So very excited. Um, and like Brian said, it really enables customers to put their monies where their hearts are. They've told us that they have a desire to do that, and so we're able to do that, um, make it easy for them, like they asked us to, um, through this shop. Um, and then again, just to reiterate a point that Brian brought up, this credibility that we get through the Sustainability Consortium is also really important to our customers. Um, so they, they need that from us, and we're providing it to them through this store. Um, but my favorite part is the fact that they don't have to sacrifice price to shop for envir environmental environmentally friendly products. We heard a lot from the panelists about how our aim is to make this mass and to make this accessible, and so we're doing that. And customers come to Walmart for everyday low prices, that's what they trust us for, but now they also can come to us and trust us to help them shop consciously for those items. So very exciting, um, big day, a lot of hard work to bring this to life, and we look forward to seeing it evolve and advance um, in partnership with suppliers who are driving the um, adoption of sustainable manufacturing. So it's great. Um, so thank you for the time today, and with that, I'd like to invite Kathleen McLaughlin up to help us understand a little bit more about why this is so important. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Brian. I'm so delighted to be here today. Um, contrary to what's written there, I'm actually the Senior Vice President of Sustainability at Walmart and also the President of the Walmart Foundation, although I do love our omni-channel assortments. <laughs> can recommend them highly. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be here today with Elizabeth Sturkin. 
Elizabeth is the managing director of the Environmental Defense Fund's corporate partnerships. And she has worked long and hard many years with Walmart and other companies uh, on sustainability issues. And we wouldn't be where we are today on many of our topics, chemicals, fertilizer, and so on, if it weren't for her partnership and the Environmental Defense Fund. She also happens to be a board member of the Sustainability Consortium. So Elizabeth, thank you for joining me. Thank you. I would love to hear from you, <laughs> what does this step represent for the industry more broadly? Um, so, so what, how do you see this moving us all forward as we try to tackle sustainability together with other retailers and other suppliers? And where do you think it needs to go from here? Well, I'm, thanks Kathleen. Uh, I'm really proud as a partner of Walmart. Environmental Defense Fund has been working for years together with Walmart and the Sustainability Consortium. And this is a huge first step. This is really the first time that we've been able to measure product sustainability and present that in a really transparent way to the customer. And, uh, and do it in a way that Walmart can only do and provide the scale that only Walmart can provide. It's a very important first step. Um, it's the first time a science-based index is available and then the consumers have the power. They can reward the suppliers who are the best. They can incentivize others to do more. And I think that's how we really get the kind of big change that we need. And I, I really want to celebrate at this point. And I really want to say this is an impressive first step. And also acknowledge it's just a first step. And I, I will also be the first to acknowledge that, that uh, it's far from perfect. You know, this is badging at the supplier level, not the product level. It's supplier-based data. And frankly, it's only on Walmart.com. You know, I want to see it in the stores. I want to see it cover fresh food. And since you're in charge of Omnichannel, um, I want to <laughs> see, see Omnichannel for sustainability. And I think you also made the really big point that if we are going to succeed in making products truly sustainable and really impacting the planet, the only way that we do that is by all working together. And I want to see other retailers step up, other online retailers like Amazon. Uh, they've got to be a part of this solution to try and drive the big change that we need. I'm intrigued to hear from you. Kathleen, in this time of uh, fierce competitiveness and you know financial challenges in retail and in consumer product industry, I'm wondering what what do you think that this means today? This sustainability means both for the short term and long term business. Well, as a number of people have said today, um, we're a mission driven company, and our mission is to save people money so that they can live better, and that means lowering the cost of what we provide to people. And for us, that means lowering the true cost of what we're providing to people. You know, as a couple of folks have pointed out today, we don't think customers should have to make a trade-off between something they can afford and something that's, that's truly sustainable. And so um, it's good business. There are a number of ways that that plays out for us. Manuel talked about some of those earlier. You know, when we work on our own operational footprint in terms of energy efficiency and waste reduction, that's cost reduction for us. Very real, very tangible, very near term. If we look at these product chains, when we're working on the hot spots, as Sheila was describing them, in each of those product chains, we are lowering the near and present cost of those items, but we are also securing the future supply of those items for our customers. And we're ensuring that we're delivering those products to people in a way that truly is sustainable, not only for the planet and replenishing our natural capital, but for the people who work in those chains. Um, so we're dead serious about this. This is right at the intersection of what's good for business and what's good for society. Now that said, to your point, this is going to require even more pre-competitive collaboration across the sector. This isn't something Walmart can do on our own. Yes, we have scale, but this is a whole industry undertaking, whole sector undertaking. So I would just like to invite those here in the audience and those who may be watching on the webcast, other retailers, uh, you know, suppliers, we invite you to work with us on this. This is something we'd love to make an industry utility. This is the basics. Let's have everybody agreeing on the science and working together on the issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be in much better service of all of our customers. Thanks, Kathleen. I'm, I'm really excited. And now let's call to action. Let's get this going. Can customers do your part. 
uh, buy products on walmart.com. <laughs> uh, suppliers start making better products and um, all of us, let's start pulling in the same direction to really create a sustainable planet for people and the environment. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Love to hand it over to you, Neil, to close us out. Thanks. Thank you. I, I want to go back to what Elizabeth said. So if we could just get customers to buy more of these great products at Walmart.com, the whole world's a uh, whole world's a better place. Um, so what what a great day. What a great meeting. Um, John, thank you for turning the theme of the meeting into wouldn't it be cool if. And, um, and so wouldn't it be cool if the largest retailer in the world decided to take on the challenge of sustainability? And wouldn't it be cool if that, um, that that retailer created a platform to bring together friends old and new, to bring together companies large and small, and brought them together in a way that could serve customers and make the world a little bit better place as, as we went along. So, so thank you to, uh, to our panel of, of young companies that are making a difference. Thank you to our vendor partners who are making a difference. Um, thank you to the Sustainability Index for creating this platform of data that we can use to, uh, to, uh, to empower sustainability. Manuel, thank you for your leadership. Michael, I'm definitely taking you to cocktail parties to talk about trash, <laughs> trash in prisons. I, I can't think of a better way to uh, to uh, endear yourself to, uh, to a cocktail chatter. Um, but, um, but we wanted to all bring this together. We wanted to bring together the scale of Walmart around sustainability, the power of technology that we're doing here, and to integrate it into our shopping experience, because that's where it really makes a difference. These products, which are outstanding, provided to us by suppliers who have a commitment to make the, the world a little bit better place, helping us serve that mission that we can help people save money so they can live better, both um, by having better products at a lower cost and a lower true cost, as Kathleen mentioned. So, so thank you. Um, but I would also point out that the challenges are both large and small. So as we think about kind of how we can change the entire system, and as Doug challenged us and will challenge each of you to take it to the next level, we should also remember we can make a difference every day with the little things also. So I wanted to share a couple statistics about just our building here in San Bruno. We changed the, uh, the technology for our printers and how we route print it, pay, um, our print jobs to our printers. We've saved 20% of the uh, paper usage in this building. The cafeteria that we're part of here has, has donated over 6,100 pounds of food uh, just this year. And we have reduced our, our, our contribution to landfills. Um, 95.8% of our waste here is recycled. So, um, so we're making a big difference on an individual scale. And we'll challenge you to make the big differences and make the, the small differences as well. So, so thank you. And none of this happens without people. Alex Jimenez, where are you? We, uh, we celebrate. Come on up. We celebrate at, uh, at Walmart, we have a little tradition, especially at Walmart e-commerce, when something really good happens, the person who did that, and Alex, you're responsible for the creation of the store, so, so thank you for that hard work. The, um, the person is rewarded generally with the opportunity to lead the Walmart cheer. So Alex, would you please lead us to the Walmart cheer? Uh, I would like to invite all, my, uh, all the team that actually made all this uh, experience possible. Creative team. Mobile. Ready? Give me a W. W. Give me a A. A. Give me a L. L. Give me a squiggly. Wiggly. Give me a M. M. Give me a A. A. Give me a R. R. Give me a T. T. What that spell? Walmart. Whose Walmart is it? It's my Walmart. Who's number one? Customer always. Who? <gasps>